Warning, this podcast episode contains spoilers for the episodes of the 60th anniversary specials, The Wild Blue Yonder, and of course The Giggle, and mostly other spoilers that have come to play from the weekend. So, if you've not watched these episodes yet, I would advise that you turn away now before you are spoiled. You have been warned. Apologies, guys, for not bringing in the review a little bit sooner, as over the course of last weekend, I was a little bit busy with something else, so I wasn't able to do a review for Wild Blue Yonder, but as it became to play as a tiny little bit like a two-parter, I thought, why not just do them back-to-back in a single episode? So here goes. So then, Wild Blue Yonder. What an episode. It delved into something a little bit creepy and, of course, not done by Doctor Who before. And you can tell that they've definitely got a new budget. And if you watch the behind the scenes of Doctor Who Unleashed, you'll know that they've got a brand new VFX budget. And some of it is practical effects and some of it is VFX, but they've done really well with the episode creepy, completely out of the normal. I wasn't even phased by the constant thing what's going on over Twitter, or should I say X. I don't like the name. X just doesn't sound right for a thing. I much prefer Twitter, but we go. So, yeah, um, all over Twitter and social media after the episode aired, we saw people with views about a coloured actor to play the part of Isaac Newton, or oh, Sir Isaac Newton, obviously d- discovering gravity, um, which obviously then had a bit of a joke, and he ended up discovering Mavity instead, which was interesting. So it was one of those episodes where you didn't know what was going to happen. They kept this one secret from us. So they didn't show us any spoilers from it. So it was going into an episode completely blind when nobody knew what was going to go on. So it picked up from the Star Beast episode where Donna had poured coffee all over the TARDIS and the TARDIS had malfunctioned. And obviously the coffee for some reason and the TARDIS do not mix. And it looks like that the TARDIS has got a fault with it. And they land on a tree the Sir Isaac Newton tree where the apple falls and he discovers gravity from the apple. And I found out that the last time that actually happened in Doctor Who was when the fourth Doctor jumped out of the tree because he dropped the apple from it to make Isaac Newton discover gravity. Now that's, I don't know because I've not watched the episode that it's supposedly in. So I don't know much about that and I have to look out for that one when I'm watching my fourth Doctor episodes. It seems to me that they've done a really fun new thing with Doctor Who. They're doing a lot of new effects and they're really giving their all and there's new writing from it. Like Russell T. Davies is, yeah, it's writing and it it seems to be that it's a Doctor and Donna and everything. But there's something different about Tennant this time. His Doctor's very different, obviously, because he's lived through the 11th, 12th, and 13th Doctors, so he's got all that history behind him. And it was really good. Um, 
it was creepy, as I say, and the Doctor going to the end of the universe, which he says he hasn't been, but obviously he has, but in a different sort of sense. So I give that episode a solid four out of five stars. There was some stuff about it that was a bit off-putting. There was some stuff about it that was a little bit crazy. And yeah, it was a very strange episode. You didn't know what was going to happen. Left, right and centre. There was obviously the creepy baddies in it that tried to copy the Doctor and Donna and then turned into gigantic giants chasing them. And there was a robot with a bomb and there was all that it just it felt like something they just really threw the budget at and did really well and they just felt like a david tennant doctor who it felt like 2008 but they'd brought in a bigger special effects they'd brought in a new cast brought back some of the old cast obviously they have brought back obviously the donna noble and her family and everything and it just felt like a continuation of that story, which it was meant to be. And then, of course, at the end of the episode, spoiler, we get a brief little scene with Wilf. And that was really touching, that scene. That scene had me on the edge of my seat just thinking, I wonder if there's going to be any more with Wilf. I wonder if he's going to be in the next episode and be, I don't know, captivated by the toy maker or something and then unfortunately after the episode aired i watched the doctor who new confidential thing unleashed as they call it i much prefer confidential but we'll go with that they said that it was one scene only that wilf would be appearing because unfortunately when they filmed it, the news broke that Bernard Cribbins was very unwell for the last rest of the filming, and he unfortunately died before they could film anything else, which is really sad. And he put a tribute in the episode, and I was having good talks with people, thinking, that can't be right. Well, they were saying to me, that can't be right. They've seen, obviously, set photos of him in what looks to be the aftermath of what is happening with the toy maker. It, it can't be right. They've, they've seen other stuff and all that. I went on Instagram and I look at Russell T. Davies' thing and it, he's put a tribute out there for Wilf. And he, yeah, he only was able to film one scene. And there so was the thing in Doctor Who Unleashed where it was shown that he was at the script read. They do the, the um, table read of the episode. And he only had them lines. And they wanted him for more. They had so much more planned for him. And it was just not a thing. And he was he was gone. And they couldn't include him even more. The episode was really well done. With the revealing of how the TARDIS just reacts to certain bits of danger. So in the whole episode, he was without a sonic screwdriver. Because it's controversial that people just say, Oh, the sonic screwdriver is like a magic wand. And... They just feel like it can do anything. And obviously the new Sonic screwdriver with David Tennant, it, it can pretty much do any, anything and, and everything. A shield, a flipping screen comes up out of nowhere. Everything's done by that thing. So it was nice to have the Sonic gone for the particular episode as well. And the TARDIS as well. So he didn't have a getaway until the very end of the episode where he nearly saved the wrong Donna. We as fans were at the end of our couches thinking, oh my God, Donna Noble's going to die and Russell T. Davis is going to pull what they call Stephen Moffat these days. Is where they just kill companions. They bring them back and just kill them. And I knew in my heart, I was thinking, nah, he can't do that. He needs to close the Noble storyline and have it so they continue along and something happens and they did that so moving on to the giggle i found that that episode was a very good episode now a lot of the fans what i saw post on social media before the episode and after the episode 
speculations. I saw one of the people's speculations come true, and I find that it's one of those episodes again where we've got brief uh, glimpses of it in the trailer, but there wasn't much to go on of what actually happens throughout. Like, we never saw what the Toy Maker's actually like. The Toy Maker, I've not seen the original episode with William Hartnell on the Toy Maker, so I only had to go on the little glimpses of him in the episode and how he came to characterise. But I'm going to go back and watch that and then watch the episode again to see the difference and all that. But the Toy Maker played absolutely amazingly by Neil Patrick Harris is a very cool villain. Now, for what I saw on Doctor Unleashed as well, when Russell T. Davies actually wrote the script for The Giggle, he didn't think of Neil Patrick Harris for the part of Toy Maker. And for what it seems to be that he wanted him to be German, but throughout the whole of the episode, he switches from German to English to American to a little bit of other accents as well, a little bit of French in there. So it's not like he was thing, but the, the actual script was written in sort of German accent. So the stuff that Germans talk like. And a producer went to Russell T. Davies, well, you need someone who can puppet, which I never knew that Neil Patrick Harris could do. So he's a puppeteer. He needs someone who can shuffle cards, is a magician, can dance, can act, can do them pretty much all of it. And he can. I've seen uh, Neil Patrick Harris in a few different things. Not loads, but some some stuff to know what he's like as an as an actor slash performer. And he he's he just steps into the role like and gives it his his all. And the funny scenes of him doing the dance during in the unit building where he comes out with a Spice Girls song and dances around and throws all the people around and then obviously the sadness about him killing the unit guards with things and then making everybody shoot petals out of the guns. But yeah, and then the tricks that he does with the ball and makes the corridors with the part the scenes with, with Donna and the Doctor where he makes all of the corridors the same Every time you go for a door, it's the same corridor and all that, and makes it a maze pretty much. And then he kind of put throws a doctor in it and puppets the companions that are between the Donna and obviously the and now. So in the fifteen or so years that the noble family have been away from Doctor Who, that what's happened to the Doctor? Who has he met? Who has he seen? who's died, who's still living out there, like Clara, like Amy, like everybody pretty much, what's happened. And it's it's trying to like show that it's not safe with the Doctor, which in some cases it's not, but in most cases it is. And I find that scene was quite cool, how he just, he's manipulating the Doctor and everything like that. He played, as I say, he played the character really, really well. And the fact that he's multi-talented at accents and multi-talented at performing and everything, it just shows that he really went in for that role and he looked like he was really happy to do it. Like the interview with him said, I saw the part, I read the full script and he was like, yeah, I need to go to, I need to fly to, to Cardiff and do this. And he did and it turned out really well. And for that, I find that the toy maker was a great villain, but they defeated him in the end. But not just the fourteenth Doctor, as we're going to number him, defeated him. I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting a regeneration at some point during the episode, and I thought that was going to be right at the very, very end. That would see Shuigawa as the Doctor. In a first scene, sort of thing, like you not know, like the usually thing when when people regenerate. So when the doctors normally regenerate, they have times when they have an all episode as with, with that doctor, the departing doctor. And at the end, then they go goodbye to the companions, and they'll swander. 
he or she, should I say, will wander off in their TARDIS. And so they'll regenerate, or they'll regenerate somewhere outside, or they'll regenerate somewhere. Like, Jodie's Doctor regenerate outside, and then obviously the thing with that. They didn't really did do him a lot of explanation of why the Doctor was in the clothes from the regeneration. It might have been in the comic books that a lot of people that I know have mentioned that they obviously the 40th Doctor has comics and little adventures before we see him in the Star Beast. So who knows, that might be mentioned there. But it was fun to see a whole new dynamic of gener- regeneration called by generation which obviously split David Tennant's Doctor, the 14th Doctor, and the 15th Doctor split them apart. And now we have a sort of storyline where the Doctor goes to live with Donna and he still has adventures by the sounds of it. It looks like he's going to still have adventures, but it seems to be that he's going to be homebound for a little bit. And who knows, we might get a spin-off. But we see Shooty and Tennant pretty much destroy the toy maker and we see them yeah it's one of them and then when they've destroyed the toy maker there's a little scene where the master who was supposedly in the toy maker's golden tooth be picked up by an unknown hand so that's going to be interesting when that gets revealed it seems to be that's going to be a, one of those sort of takes a few episodes to explain and then suddenly they go oh it was so and so and then the master's back and then we might get a different incarnation or we might get Sasha back but we don't know so that's to come as well I think but I'm hoping that they leave the master out of the first series because he's just overused at the moment or she he hadn't he slash she is overused at the moment so I think that they should do a whole series of shooty with different villains and different monsters and foes before they go back to the Daleks or the Master or the Cybermen and see how it all plays out first before they bring them back. So it's interesting dynamic that they've that they've split the TARDIS into two. Not directly into two, but like they've it took a hammer to it and, and hit it and it it gave them a, a TARDIS copy. But it's funny how Shooty took the copy TARDIS instead of the original, which was interesting. So he left David with the original TARDIS instead of taking the original and leaving David with the copy. But the copy contains a jukebox as a new addition, and obviously Shooty's doing it his own colour color variations of it. And that looks quite cool, how he's gone in there and taking it and making it his own and I'm not against it but I've noticed a lot of backlash that they feel like that the Doctor has now got a bit of a let's say homosexual tendency to him and characteristics. Now I know that Shuri Gatwa who plays the 15th Doctor he's playing it really well. I know we only, was only seen him for like what five ten minutes maximum of screen time but i see the role has been safe with him and i'm really looking forward to seeing him as a doctor of the christmas special onwards and i will be doing a review for that christmas special of course to show what i think obviously shoot his first episode because i always give a new incoming doctor a chance to get into the role maybe have a series before i start judging them but i will review the, his first episode and then i'll try to review the episodes onwards so that you get a understanding of how i see him as the doctor and all that and it seems to be that he seems to be doing quite well already and i like how instead of making it so that the the doctor is in his new clothes straight away it kind of splits 14's costume between them both and she was running around with no pants on and it's it just it just had a bit of fun and it's just how how they've done that with the with the bi-regeneration thing it's gone to like 
a completely historical thing like they've never done this before and it's written in as well it's a myth in time lord history that it's not a thing that normally happens so they've written in a new bit of storyline to the doctor and of course they bring in that obviously lordy companions and all that happened and the return of mel as part of the unit storyline was quite was quite good as well and the fact that donna might be working for for unit as well in the future so that's probably where they're going to do it i feel like they're going to do a unit spin-off with donna working at unit and potentially having david Tennant pop up every now and again and they closed it with obviously the doctor the 14th doctor variation to live with Donna and potentially to have potential to go on adventures in the in their TARDIS in the TARDIS as well. And a friend of mine, no no, all over social media as TARDIS man, Aidan Wilkinson, who is the best that I know of who creates TARDIS renders on social media, he's already gone and taken the screenshots on the episode and put in instead of obviously getting a copy of the normal TARDIS, he's put it as, as if it got a copy and it ends up being Ten's original TARDIS, which is quite cool, which would have been a fun throwback to see, but it's just how they would go about rebuilding the, the original set, they'd have to rebuild it from scratch again, so they would have tore it down the original to change it into mats and obviously they've continued to tear them down to change them into each of them but they've they've had tense TARDIS before for the Doctor Who experience so they could have rebuilt a, a section of it just showing the outer bit instead of the whole TARDIS console room and just have it so it appears slightly and then they have time to rebuild it if they want to rebuild it if not it's like it glitches out and maybe it's returns to the current one but it'd be nice to say like a, a throwback like oh he's trying to choose whether he's trying to choose whether he wants that one or he wants a new one he could go right i've had the coral theme right now let's let's stick with the new one and maybe put some of the orangey sort of color back to it so it is a cross between both tardises so with the giggle i give it a solid five out of five they're exploring new stuff and yeah, I'm with the fans in places. I did kind of want some of uh, nods to like old who and have other class classic and new who doctors appear. But I didn't think it as necessary. It felt instead of being a rehash of the fiftieth anniversary, it felt more that we got a sort of new who anniversary in a way. It's 18 years of New Who. And yeah, there's people that are going, well, I wanted somebody else to have a, a go at playing the Doctor again for it. And yeah, there was a speculation just before the Wild Blue Yonder was on that they might have darker versions of the Doctor haunting him for the enemies in that because obviously we had the copies of the doctor and donna and everything that they thought that he's gonna they're gonna turn into variations of that doctor or variations of the doctor from different things but it seems to be that matt smith has gone on to go into hollywood and obviously big films and stuff like that so it's like he's not really available to play the doctor as much and for what i heard of peter capaldi it seems to me that he doesn't want to return to the role. At least not as far as I know. And I heard a rumour the other day that potentially that Peter Capote was fired from the role. Now, I don't know if that's true. That's just speculation. I I can't confirm that. That's there's nothing there's nothing confirming that. Just like there's nothing confirming about the true meaning of why the knife doctor left you can only go by what he says 
what he says could be a deemed down version of it. There could be more to there could be more to it than what meets the eye pretty much. But it was a nice it was a really good episode. There was a lot going on with the giggle and the fact that we had it was the giggle was taking over people's minds and they had to put little like armband things on to stop them from from being subject to the to the anger and thing like that. That was quite a cool thing to explore. But I give that yeah, I give that episode a solid five out of five stars. It was a very good episode. The thing I spotted about it, and this is not me having a bit of a nit gritty moan about it, but they had a bit of a standing for Bernard Cribbins because it was meant to be that he was going to be in the episode. It's meant to be that he's in the opening with Donna and the Doctor when everything's chaotic and everybody driving around and things are exploding and planes are going down and all sorts of things going on and all that chaos. Uh, there's a brief glimpse of Wolf and he's they he tells they tell the um unit soldiers to get into safety before anything else. And you hear him talk, but I believe that's probably archive audio from probably an old Talk to episode, unless everyone was able to get a few lines from something. So it could be that. Yeah, um, they had a stand-in. It was noticeable for a brief second that it was definitely a stand-in because you could see the like strap. It was they tried to hide it. It was a white strap of um, as the beard of Will. So they obviously put on another of another stand-in for him, which is understandable because obviously Bernard Cribbins didn't make it to be able to film. He was too ill to film. But it's a nice nod to it, so that they've kept the character alive in the universe and made it so that he's not he's not died. And they had to make the excuse he was out shooting moles. The Doctor put up force fields so that he couldn't shoot the moles, which was quite a funny nod to that. So yeah, between the both episodes, I liked the giggle more than last one. Now between the both episodes, I liked all of them equally. They all had something that made the episode quite thrilling and and new and they they really tried tried it with it all. The reason I'm giving the giggle a five out of five is because it explored completely new territory and it had a nice new villain. He stepped into the part of it and it really blew my mind. And they were false, but yeah, I, I give it a solid five out of five. Like New Who is in safe hands now with Shooty and I'm sure that he will give it his all in the part and it looks like he's going to give it his all in the part from what I've seen of the special what's coming up on Christmas Day. It looks like he's going to really jump into it and now I wasn't expecting them to reveal it so soon but they have now brought out a new sonic screwdriver. I say sonic screwdriver because that's what it's meant to be but it doesn't look like one and until I see it in action I'm not sure what to think of it. My view is it looks quite cool like it's like a remote sort of thing it's something completely new shaped it's, it reminds me of the click remote from the film Click with Adam Sandler. That's what loads of people on social media are saying it just, just looks doesn't look like a sonic screwdriver anymore doesn't look remotely like a screwdriver well to be fair the screwdrivers never really looked like a sonic screwdriver and there's been sort of, all sorts of stuff across the show's run that was used even in the early 60s they didn't have the technology to make like a fancy sonic screwdriver so for what i heard they used a torch or a pen or something what looks like a little thing to make it look like a Sonic and they had Sonics further down the line and we had the Sixth Doctor with a Sonic glance and we had the Twelfth Doctor with a Sonic's sunglasses. So why not have something new? And it then leaves David with a Sonic screwdriver as well and it's very close with the blue lighting and all that to be sort of a newer model of his old one. So let him have that and let's shoot have something new. And what I'm hoping as well is because he's customised the newer TARDIS 
because he's not getting his own fresh one. And I thought, being that they've only just built the brand new TARDIS, I very much doubt they're going to give him a whole fresh TARDIS. They could do it later, later down the line. They could dim, somehow demolish that TARDIS and give him a fresh version. But I feel like it's just going to be a colour variation to the console, maybe, like they did with 11 and 12. They give Matt a new TARDIS, but then when it came to for Peter Capaldi to get the TARDIS, they just modelled it a few different ways and made it so that he had a bookcase and a few things that kind of made it his, his and made that the inner console in the middle time rotor thing was red instead of a bluey green colour. So yeah, I feel like Shooty will customise it his own. He's got a jukebox, he's changed the colouring a little bit, he's making it a bit darker and all that. So who knows, you never know, we might even get a new TARDIS. But what I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping that as well as giving him a new Sonic and him letting him customise the TARDIS and he's got his new costume and everything, which looks great and everything, I'm hoping that they change out the titles and give him his own opening titles and make it a little bit better for the logo reveal. Because the logo reveal was a bit, yeah, iffy. It didn't feel like, like it had much to it. I thought it was going to like dissolve in or at least like crumbling or do something funny, it just like it just pops in, it's like, it's there. I thought they'd do something, because obviously they made the, the TARDIS skate around the vortex and go in and out of clouds and all that, you'd think that they'd do something crazy with the, with the title reveal, but they didn't, and it just looked a bit iffy. So I'm hoping that Shuri gets his own little opening titles. Even if they'd have to reuse the theme, I'm alright if they reuse the theme, but make it his own title sequence, maybe change the theme out a little bit. He's got his own little Doctor theme, which I noticed was playing when he was sorting the TARDIS out and getting ready to set off. So, yeah, it seems like it's going to be in good hands. And that's it for my episode of the Anything podcast. And I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to be releasing episodes on certain topics of day-to-day things. But more than likely, my next episode will be done around the Christmas special to review the Christmas special. Maybe on the day or more than likely the time around the special. It might not be straight after the special. Because I may not even be able to watch it on broadcast. It all depends if I'm in on Christmas, if, unless I'm being out or, you know, been invited around or something like that. So you'll get my review. So yeah, I've been Adam Bray. This has been the Anything Podcast. Please like and share the podcast episode as much as you can. And subscribe to my channel. I It means a lot to me that people have subscribed to me and watch my videos, listen to my audios, and do all sorts of stuff. So I'm very appreciative. Stay safe out there, guys. And thank you for viewing slash listening.